and to participate in the spirit of our dialogue of talking about the problems that we have. Not saying we don't have those problems, everything is fine, but to talk openly about it and to recognize and to state very good, we have something essentially um, challenging, which it's not so clear, and in your intellectual honesty, not so clear whether it's resolvable. And just to be able to make that statement, I could tell you as part of the of these trialogues or the Jews, this is the first stage of, of a community's healing. And we're witnessing a spokesperson and a person of depth who's getting up and saying to you, no, oh, no, no, it's, it's, oh, they're just distorting. It's all a distortion. It's all, no, it's not. We have issues that we have to deal with. And uh, for that alone, just to be able to participate in that, it's like, thank God we're getting there. <laughs> it's like there's, this is when we speak about what America could produce for our three religious traditions. This is the beginning of the next stage of our discussions. So for that, number one, I am very, very grateful. Um, the question I would, I would pose to you would be to juxtapose something that Jim said with the notion of the solution that you spoke about. And I'm posing it as a question, not one, truly as a question, not as a dilemma. I don't know the answer to it. Is, because we have here two paradigms on how to engage modernity. One is to define tradition as experience, and in so doing, reaffirm new experiences as tradition, no different than the experiences of the past, but where you reaffirm from the beginning that there is a new experience which you find a way to, you, you, you see ultimately within your tradition, but you are very much attuned to the fact that there is an innovation going on here. While Vince precisely because of the tradition of Islam, speaks of the essential nature of creating some type of continuity and showing that this innovation is as authentic as the others. I would love it if that would work. The dilemma that I have is that once you enter into the discourse of trying to be as traditionally authentic, can you ever win? And I don't know. I would like it to be so. Um, can you restate that? Can you restate that for us? Yeah, about tradition and once you enter in. In other words, when you're dealing with people who are against innovation, who speak in the name of tradition, there are, I would, if you want to know your own authenticity, then I understand why you speak in a certain language. When you want to affect political change, I have never seen that type of, of, uh, of discussion ever creating on one side that transformation because no matter what you say, they're going to say, no, that's not a tradition. That's really not authentic. Once you enter into that discourse, you've almost, you've lost it. Because their claim for authenticity will always trump yours. Because at the end of the day, you know that you're finding something. You know, I grew up as a as a Hartman in orthodox circles. Now that doesn't mean much to many of you, but suffice it to say, it's my parents sent me to very, very traditional schools to get a very good education. 
And my life was one of complete and total outsidership. Um, and engaging with people whose faiths and beliefs were very different than mine and trying to change them, saying, no, you got it wrong. No, 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 this is, let me show you, this is the, this is the real meaning. You know, oh, you thought it was this. No, no, it's this. And I don't, I'm, what I have experienced is that transformation comes when a community could make the type of move that Jim spoke about, where you first leap, embrace a certain, and validate a certain experience, and then you try for your own in religious integrity to find a language which you can use. If you don't make that first leap, and you're walking in the path of interpretation, you'll find personal validity, but you can't affect others significantly. And the question I face, or a question I, I is, is, is that possible um, within Islamic society? And what type of teaching needs to happen for that type of embracing of the new, which is then supported afterwards, but you know that it's not the old. And while you can say, oh, the perceptions of the past are always fabrications. That could be granted, but the people who believe those fabrications have constructed a religious world on the basis of them. And so it's, uh, we, we, we witnessed here a very bold criticism of, or, or declaration that, yes, we have issues. Um, I'm wondering how, and because and, we're, we're all in this together. We all want our traditions to be helpful to each other. I'm wondering whether if some of the experiences of Judaism and Christianity could be helpful for Islam. Um, and I think the way most of Judaism and Christianity went was a leap of faith, um, but a leap of faith into the value of modernity and to the value of innovation, and then the justification happened afterwards. I fully uh, associate myself with Daniil's appreciation of, of what Vincent uh, has done for us today. Um, very instructive, very serious, and, uh, and very, very important. Let me respond very simply and briefly by lifting up what I understand to be the epistemological crisis uh, which I associate with, I think that the epistemological crisis as defined by Vincent applying to the Islamic world is one that is a human crisis, broadly speaking today, and it goes to the question of how do we know? And uh, taking off from a passing reference that Daniel made uh, earlier today um, when he uh, renounced my dearly held uh, faith in original sin, um, I would like to say that original sin to me means we human beings are born with a constitutional, a, 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 a constitutional tendency to identify ourselves positively by identifying somebody else negatively. The bifurcated imagination divides reality between oppositions, innovation versus tradition. We just had a very wonderful example of this human impulse. This is not Islam, this is human. Innovation versus tradition, virtue versus wickedness, knowledge versus ignorance. Uh, the political philosophy that we've just been instructed in is a grappling with the bipolar structure of the human imagination. Con leading to uh, Vincent's very apt and bold proposal to us that maybe there is something to the clash of civilizations, N not in the trivial uh, 
caricature uh, way of, as we have from Huntington. But maybe there is. And, of course, there is because what we're talking about is the human condition of being in conflict by definition with ourselves. The human condition is the condition of being broken into polarities. And what is the solution to that? And I'll just close by offering as a non-Muslim my single largest appreciation of the prophet Muhammad, who I understand to have been a genius appreciator of the oneness of God. When we talk about the three monotheistic traditions, we're not talking about God is one in the sense of a number. There's one God over against those other religions that have many gods. No, this is not a numerical uh, assertion about God. We're not talking about one God. We're talking about oneness of God, the oneness of God. And what is that? What is that? What, the oneness of God imbued in creation is the contradiction to the human impulse to understand reality as, by definition, broken. Human beings live in the oneness of God, which is the religious response to the condition of the clash of civilization. And Islam was born, as I understand it, outside of Islam, in the ingenious appreciation of oneness that, in Arabia at least, had perhaps been lost sight of by the Jews and Christians who were part of the very divided tribal world. And the sweeping triumph of the Islamic movement, I believe, is not about violence. It was about the way in which a, a whole range of tribal peoples responded to this preaching of the oneness of God as a profoundly relevant answer to the condition of division and conflict that was the definition of their lives. So the no um, in innovation, well, yes, we should say no to innovation if we regard it as the opposite of tradition. But if we understand in oneness that authentic innovation is a fulfillment of the tradition, then we don't necessarily find ourselves condemned to permanent clash, much less permanent warfare. While you're getting some questions ready uh, to, trans to transition, uh, to me one of the benefits of all these things is all the questions you take home about your own uh, and I have a hunch everybody's doing that. I, I like to read your faces when these points come along. And some years ago, I did a dialogue in Houston for the Hakeem Olajuwon Foundation. I didn't even know who he was until then, but my grandson said, you're going and you're going to bring his autograph back. And he brought me a regulation basketball to Jonathan Marty from Hakeem Olajuwon. Very serious foundation, and they got 600 Muslims, limited to that, and 600 Christians, mainly Baptist and Catholic, in this huge ballroom, and a Nova Scotia expert on uh, Islam and Christianity spoke, and then I spoke, and then everybody got their three by five cards, and then we had lunchtime, and I'm s sitting there with uh, Olajuwon and his brothers, all of whom were over seven feet. I thought, when are they going to sit down? I was <laughs> looking up at them there. <laughs> and, and I was ready for all the questions, and so was the uh, Muslim, about divorce, polygamy, all these questions that people think, not one question. And it illustrates what we just heard again and also in James's response, how hard it is to break through to this basic question. Um, the Christians in the room, I don't think, uh, could understand how the Muslims could have this full sense in the unity of God and one God without a mediator, without a, you know, how does it become incarnate or whatever. And from the other side, the Muslims said, how can you be monotheists and you have three. 
So I told him about an attempt by a missionary to uh, <clears throat> speak to in a Japanese about it. And after about an hour of lecturing on three and one, one and three, the one Japanese said, ah, I understand you Christians now. You are ruled by a committee. <laughs> and, and they tried another one, showing the symbol of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as a dove. Honorable Father, I understand. Honorable Son, I understand. Honorable Dove, Bird, I don't understand at all. Um, it is really hard to penetrate, and the thing I take home is in colonial New England, Puritan New England, which had a tremendous influence on later American religion, according to both Perry Miller and Peter Gay, there was no dirtier word than innovation. All you had to do to be in trouble as a preacher in New England was to praise innovation. And I think we see here that this is the kind of struggle that we are going on in Islam today. Have we questions? Number one. Yeah, well, we're waiting for questions. Is, is yeah, okay. Is this on? Please. All right. Ah, there we go. Uh, I just want to um, um, answer one of the points brought up by Daniel. Uh, Daniel's point, I think, is really important about whether or not um, whether or not we're stuck in an impasse that we can't get out of. And um, I remember one of the Christian writers who's always influenced me has been the late uh, historian of Christianity, Yaroslav Pelikan. Uh, from Yale University who uh, actually did some lectures on tradition and change uh, a while back. And, and when he talked about tradition, he says, tradition is not like a standing jump. It's like a running broad jump or change through tradition. He says that all real change that happens in a religion means you go somewhere else by going first through where you've been. And I think it's a very good metaphor to use for what I'm what I'm advocating, what I advocated at the end of my talk in the sense that I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get away with it. I think Danielle's question is an important, very, very important uh, uh, question to bring up. But this is what we're trying to do, that the answer, I think, would have to lie if, 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 histor if Islamic thought is historically conceived, is going to embrace the modern condition, or at the very least to coexist with the modern condition, there has to be a notion of change built into tradition. In other words, tradition can't be static. Tradition itself has to be seen as changeable. And that's the advantage of his history of religions. When you look back at religions, whether, whether, whatever religion it is, you can see that you know, ideas develop. They're never static. They change. And so I think the problem is the notion among people that ideas are static and that change itself is dangerous. I mean, this is you know, after all, you know, the reason Muslims like Plato so much, along with many medieval Christians, was because, you know, they could, he could come up with a perfect society where, where everything was unified. Plato was a wonderful philosopher of unity because, you know, he wanted one society, one people. Everything was organic. The society was supposed to be just like the human body. Uh, you know, the imagery was all one, 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 one down the line. And this, of course, was very appealing to Muslims for the very reasons that, uh, that Marty just mentioned. You know, our world is not like that anymore. Our world is a pluralistic world, whether we like it or not. And so if we're going to think of unities, we have to think of unities with pluralism built in. Think of galaxies, maybe, rather than stars. And then if we're thinking of tradition, thinking of tradition as process, so that if you build a something, well, if, if you adapt to new conditions, which, by the way, is part of Islamic law already, but if you adapt to new conditions and you're clear that you're building on resources from the past, then it's development. It's not change. It's not necessarily bid'ah. It's, and then we can be creative without being afraid. Question one and question two. Okay. Um, I'm Jerry Ramsey, and I just recently read a survey that 17% of Americans consider themselves spiritual but not religious. And I found that very interesting. Our particular church deals with that. And so much that was said today seems to lend itself to that sort of thinking. It's very individualistic. and. Um, I just wanted to put that out for everyone to think about. Well, I'd like to offer a comment 
uh, simply to say that um, picking up on the crisis theme that Vincent just struck, religion itself is in an epistemological crisis today. And when you hear a statistic like that, it suggests that many, many people who have an innate human need to uh, articulate a relationship with the transcendent or the holy or the other world are finding it impossible to meet that need through traditional institutions of religion. And we need to take that, those of us who are committed to traditional institutions of religion need to take that very seriously. Traditional institutions of religion are failing in their purpose. And we see that especially in the difficulty so many young people have in associating themselves with the traditions of their families. I don't believe myself that over the long haul it's possible to be spiritual without religious, without being religious, if by religion we mean organic, communal, organized institutions of human beings who exist together for a common purpose to hand on something of the past to the future. That's what religious institutions do. And because they are made up of human beings, they always do it badly. But that's because they're made up of human beings. Uh, myself, um, I feel that's why it's so urgent as a Catholic to insist upon the ongoing renewal and reform of Roman Catholicism because this tradition can be lost. And that it's up to um, other people and other traditions to confront this crisis. But that's what a statistic like that suggests to me. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, Billy Ray Cyrus uh, uh, wrote a song called Achy Breaky Heart. I guess he could write a new one called Lucy Goosey Faith. Um, yeah, I, 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 if I understand that's what you're concerned about, and, and I completely agree with you about that. It's, uh, uh, yeah, the 17% of people who say we're spiritual but we're not religious um, includes some of the people that I know, in fact, some people in my own family. I won't name names. Uh, but that's, um, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, you know it's, it's nothing really. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's like a Mormon friend of mine in Arizona once called a church called the Church of All Christian Faiths, the Church of No Christian Faith. Because, I mean, you do have to draw boundaries. And, 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 and your ritual and your practice is extremely important. Um, Despite what I say when I give lectures, I'm, you know, myself, I'm very traditional when it comes to uh, worship and those aspects of religion. I mean, Islamic law divides uh, it, itself into, into something that's all ritual and worship, and then there's something that has to do with interpersonal behavior. And, and for me, I, you know, I, I do my best to try to acknowledge the value of the laws of ritual and worship. They're very, very important. Uh, one of the reasons, you know, despite my long involvement with Sufism, one of the reasons why I'm very critical of New Age Sufis is that New Age Sufis are like sort of the 17% of Sufis who are like those. I mean, what, what makes them New Age is none of them want discipline. And any spiritual path requires discipline. You, you can't get anywhere without it. Uh, and, and otherwise, you're just, you know, you're, it's, it's a vanity. I mean, you're just playing around. And so, so I, I, I don't think any of us are, are advocating that, and I hope it's not understood that way. Please, over here, and then we have three here, or two more. This is what Dr. Cornell, uh, how do you explain in countries that have an Islamic government, in other words, are governed by Islamic law, they do not afford other religions such as Christianity the freedom to practice their faith the way Muslims are allowed to practice their faith in America? My wife wanted to mail a Bible to a person in Saudi Arabia and was told, do not, if I am caught, I could possibly in, be imprisoned. Um, well, I mean, you're, you're talking about a reality that's a historical reality of, of, pardon me, of the Islamic world. <clears throat> um, even countries that are not, pardon my allergies kicking up, um, even countries that are not ruled according to the Sharia 
uh, have prohibitions against uh, proselytization. Uh, personally, I am a strong believer in um, the free market of ideas, and that includes the free market of religions. Um, I think it's an important test for Muslims uh, to be able to defend, not only defend their beliefs in comparison with other faiths, but also to affirm their beliefs in comparison with other faiths. And I think this was touched on earlier today. This is one of the advantages of of what we do in our interfaith gatherings is I, I don't think, I mean, uh, I, I've never seen anybody who has had his faith or her faith weakened in such gatherings. I've seen the faith deepened. And uh, I think it's important for Muslims to know about other religions. And again, I, you know, earlier today I made some disparaging comments about the Asharis, about this group of theologians from the Middle Ages in terms of their ideas of the universe. But one belief they had, one of their doctrines I really like very much, they drew a distinction between uh, a believer, which in Arabic is mu'min, and a Muslim. And the word Muslim in, in Arabic literally means someone who completely submits to the will of God. But they said that if you are just born a Muslim and you sort of learn it from your parents at your parents' knee and you follow it just because that's what you are, you're just a believer, you're not a Muslim. You can't call yourself a Muslim until you can actually stand up and say why it is you believe what you do and defend it against somebody who doesn't. You know, that's, that's the kind of definition of Islam that I think Muslims need today because, again, you know, by, by hiding from other, the teachings of other faiths, uh, that to me is a sign of weakness. It's, it's, it's circling the wagons. This is, a, you know, this is, this is not a sign of, of confidence. Uh, back when Islam was strong, the Islamic empires were strong, say in the time of Farabi and maybe the hundred years before him, all sorts of ideas circulated around. I mean, look at Farabi. I mean, this is a great Muslim thinker whose main teachers were Christians. You know, this didn't bother him, and it might have bothered some people, but it didn't bother the majority. He never got thrown in jail for it or anything like that. Uh, and, and, you know, this was, this was a sign of, of, of confidence. You know, back then, Baghdad was kind of the New York City of the time, you know, which you had all sorts of things. It was a huge city and all sorts of ideas. So Muslims do need to get back that confidence. And, you know, so I'm, I'm a, as I said, personally, I'm a firm believer that, you know, if Muslims can proselytize, Christians can proselytize, whatever, that's not a problem. However, one shouldn't abuse it. And I'll be, I'll be the first to say that what disturbs me about the story we've been seeing about the girl who converted to Christianity I mentioned earlier is that I have a very, very, very strong feeling from what I've seen uh, that the girl is being used as a pawn by religious leaders who are trying to manipulate a conflict. That's something I'm very much against. So, you know, sure, bring, you know, bring the word, make it be known, but with respect. Okay, we have three more here, or maybe four, please. Well, in regard to affecting political change, which was mentioned, uh, many of us would really wish for a breakthrough, for peace um, negotiations in the Middle East. Could you talk about our Western concepts of democracy and ethnocracies in regard to um, countries in the Middle East like Israel, Iran, and so on? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, totally neutral question. Yeah. <laughs> mm. The we have to find ways in which we translate our hope for peace. I would say, into two productive directions. For one of the things we have to learn, you know, if we, like, if we have Vince outlining, you know, 1,200 years of an issue, we have to, it pays to learn from experience. And whatever we've been doing up till now is not working. And we could either continue with that tradition of failure, or we could try to move in another direction. 
for peace to work or to progress to another stage, the first thing we need to do is to create a much healthier environment of self-criticism on all levels. But self-criticism only happens in a, in a safe space. Right? What, what Vince served as a witness to grows out of his comfort in living in America and embodying a certain conversation where he feels comfortable. I could talk. And he doesn't feel that his faith is being undermined or his being. When it is the criticism of the outsider to each other, it backfires all the time. And every single t and and then we get stuck in our, at best, moral mediocrity, and at worst, into circular arguments justifying evil. Precisely out of defending ourselves for some public image. So, the our aspiration. How do we create or remove a certain amount of blame language, even if we feel blame towards each other, knowing that it's just simply not constructive? And that it's not about blame, it's about each society um, creating for itself a higher standard which it believes it must live by, regardless of whether the world or others affirm that. In other words, that's one stage tremendously missing in Middle Eastern um, discourse. And our attempts of, of discussing peace very often lead to the blame of one. Oh, you love Israel. Why? Because you blame them. Oh, wow, well, you're my friend. Come. Come sit next to me. Now, do I agree with your blame? Does it serve me in any way? Does my country become a better country because you were blaming them? And I'm speaking just as a Jew, and I'm sure the same argument could go to the other side. That's one stage that we need to look at. And how do we create that environment? I would, I would say to you that the United Nations couldn't be more destructive on this level um, and people of good intent are, are, are seeding um, a very, very bad environment. That's, the one, that's one thing that needs to change. The second thing is that we need to have or to, to recognize that our yearning for peace is not the same as a policy for peace. And what it will mean to create a new reality might be on a very different time frame, for example, than an American political system. And, and we have to be very careful not to use a reality which has caused so much pain to sell a solution under a time frame that I need for other reasons, have nothing to do with what is realistic about this environment. For when you do so, you might get away with some progress in the short term. But I can, someone who lives in Jerusalem, I and my children, similar to Palestinians and their children, are going to end up having to pay the price over and over again of, oh, why can't you just? And it just seems that we can't. And so we might need much more long-term, much more incremental, much more careful, much more support and recognition of the problems than, um, than the patience level the world seems to have. And the impatience of the world hasn't created any progress. That should be something that we should remember. And uh, if it is progress that we want, I do believe that there's some very serious things that we can do. But it might be on a different time frame. Thank you very much. We have yeah, just 
Uh, can I answer the question also? Um, oh, just, excuse uh, me. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd just like to say Iran is not an ethnocracy. It's a very ideological state. Uh, it may have a president who's the world's best example of the self-hating Jew from what we've been finding recently. Apparently there's considerable inf there's information that's relatively solid that he has, a, you know, his family has a Jewish background. Uh, but if you want to find the eth true ethnocracy in the Muslim world, your country is Malaysia. Malaysia outside of Israel is the only country of which I'm aware where religion and ethnicity are exactly the same. You cannot be a Malay without being a Muslim, and you cannot be a Muslim in Malaysia without being a Malay. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, the, uh, that Anwar Ibrahim, this was the former vice prime minister who was falsely accused of being gay and thrown in jail, uh, uh, he's hopefully, I mean, I, I know him a little bit. I really hope he becomes prime minister because that's one of the things he's trying to change. And he's using Islamic teachings and ideology to get rid of that, that sort of ethnocracy that you're talking about. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it becomes a real problem because, for example, Malaysia has indigenous Christians, you know, from the area around Malacca uh, that go back about 400 years. They're as Malay as the Muslims, and yet they're in a sort of strange category because they're not, because they're not Muslim, they're not really Malay. When I was back there in the 1980s and 1990s, there was a big fear about mass conversions of Chinese because the economy is still dominated by Chinese in Malaysia. And they were afraid that the Chinese were going to subvert the country by converting en masse to Islam and, and overpowering the Malays because, as we all know, the Chinese want to take over the world. Of course, any Malay will tell you this. But they were actually making bizarre you know, proposals like how many generations must a Chinese family be Muslim before they're counted to be Malay? And and so so it's 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 a real it's, it's it's a very interesting comparative case as far as no one's ever compared it with Israel, but if I would to find if I were trying to find a country that would be sort of the Israel of the is Islamic world, it would be that country, not anything in the Middle East. Thank you. Uh, just a few minutes ago, in response to a question, uh, Jim Carroll gave what I thought was a really nice definition of why religion has to be in community, and one of the things you said uh, had to do with passing the tradition on to the next generation. So that's the background to my question, which is, do you think that the age demographic of this audience speaks to the topic of the day? Can I, can I put in a plug while they're doing this? I don't know how many of you have heard of Ibu Patel and the Interfaith Youth Corps, C-O-R-E. This Ibu, E-B-O-P-A-T-E-L. Um, He's often on Bill Moyers type things and so on. And he organized, he, he sensed this, and uh, he organized, you have to be under 30 to be in it. There are chapters all over the nation now, uh, large chapters, growing fast. Uh, you have to be under 30 and you have to be active in your own faith. Uh, my wife and I spent a day with our staff and I asked them all, when people criticize you, they were all the communitarian evangelical were there. When you get criticized, what do you get criticized for? They all assume we'll be wishy-washy and they have to give up everything. In Ibu Patel's world, you have to know your own. A typical Saturday morning, you'll discuss what your faith has to say about the family or how you read texts, and in the afternoon, they work together. And I think the way that's caught on is, is a, uh, a tremendous um, sign of the future, but I like very much the point of it. Um, well, I just have to say that, I mean, I see some students there, I'm happy to see it, but uh, since I was talking about somebody who was taking from Plato, Plato said the greatest wisdom in terms of age is between the ages of 45 and 55. So I think we can congratulate ourselves for being very wiser. Okay.